Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sugar Science Ask the Expert. The title of today's discussion is Poking at the Pancreas, Effects of a Microbiota Protein on Beta Cell Proliferation. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Karen Gulliman and Dr. Jennifer Hill. Dr. Gilliman received her PhD at Stanford University studying organ development with Dr. Mark Krasnow and completed her postdoctoral training at Stanford in bacterial pathogenesis with Dr. Stanley Falco. She started her own research lab at the University of Oregon in 2001, studying the impact of the microbiome on ver vertebrate development, focusing on a new model of notobiotic zebrafish. She has been elected to the American Academy of Microbiology, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Academy of Art and Sciences. Our second speaker, Dr. Jennifer Hill, attended graduate school at the University of Oregon in Dr. Gil Gilliman's lab. She's currently finishing her postdoctoral work at the University of Utah, where she leads a collaboration between Charlie Murtaz and June Round's labs. Excitingly, she just accepted a tenure track position at the University of Colorado Boulder, where the Hill Lab will open in June 2024. Doctors Gilliman and Hill, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for sharing your work today. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to share our work. And we'll be doing a joint presentation. I'll give some overview introductory remarks. And then uh, Jennifer will uh, tell the bulk of the story. This is really her research uh, that she drove both in her PhD work in my lab and then in her postdoctoral work. And then we'll um, end with some concluding remarks and be happy to answer questions. So we'll be telling you today about a bacterial protein that influences the development of the vertebrate pancreas. And to start, thinking about how a bacterial protein can influence animal development, we need to think about the um, evolutionary history of animals on earth. And so on the next slide, we can sort of see this timeline. And um, this uh, is here to remind us that humans are a really recent innovation of life on earth. Um, even multicellularity has been around for the minority of the time that um, living organisms have inhabited the planet. And really the history of life on earth has been dominated by prokaryotes, single cell microorganisms um, that need to uh, exist uh, on their own. But in fact, next slide, we, um, we know that um, these were not just single cell organisms in isolation, they're single cell organisms that live in complex communities of other species of single cell prokaryotic organisms. And um, uh, in order to compete for resources in space, they need to have different types of strategies that are still uh, present today in multicellular um, complex communities that coexist with animals. And in the next slide, you can see um, an example of one of these kinds of multicellular uh, prokaryotic communities in the larval zebrafish gut. And this is a, a light sheet microscopy image taken of a bacteria within the, a zebrafish gut um, that gives you a sense of just how dynamic and uh, abundant these bacteria are within the digestive tract of, of an animal. And um, uh, these uh, multi-species communities really have profound impacts on animal biology. And um, in the next slide, uh, we wanna just point out that um, a lot of the uh, biology of these multi-species communities is still really underexplored. Um, and it's through uh, innovations and in technology equivalent to innovations and um, uh, telescopes that are, are revealing the um, complexities of our galaxies. It's innovations in genomics, metabolomics, proteomics that are revealing aspects of these uh, microbial biologies that are really underexplored. But we, beyond just describing these microbes, we need to be able to do manipulative experiments to understand their impacts on animals. So the next slide, 
um, one of the approaches that we've harnessed in our work is notobiology, where we can manipulate the associations of animals with their microbes. So we can um, compare, for example, the biology of animals with their full complement of microbes, which we refer to as conventional or specific pathogen free, to animals that have been reared under microbiologically sterile or germ-free conditions, or have had their microbiomes depleted with antibiotic treatment. And um, from these kinds of comparisons, we can infer roles that the microbiota play in animal development and physiology. And then we can use manipulations such as mono associations with single strains of microbes, or even treatments with purified microbial products to identify uh, factors or organisms that are important for uh, these kinds of uh, animal biologies and can uh, reverse germ-free traits. So in today's talk, Jennifer is gonna tell you about work that she started in my lab, um, working with notobiotic zebrafish, and then continued on in uh, her postdoctoral research with June Round and Charlie Murtaugh, working with notobiotic mice, that revealed how gut bacteria can influence pancreas development. So I'll let Jennifer take it away. Um, thanks, Karen. That was a great intro. Um, I'm just going to bring up a, a pointer here that'll be a little helpful. Um, so yeah, we're really interested in how, you know, the microbiome impacts the, the biology of the pancreas and the work that I'm going to tell you about today. It's to understand it, it's really important to kind of understand this concept that our microbiome um, changes throughout the lifetime of, of a host um, within us and within, within other um, animal organisms. So when we're born and when we're you know in the womb, our gastrointestinal tract is essentially sterile. Um, but as soon as we're born, it becomes initially colonized by a small number of, of microbes. And they kind of um, pave the way to create this um, amenable environment in the gastrointestinal tract for more exotic species to come and build um, the diversity of our, our gut microbiome, such that by the time we're about three to five years old, um, the community in our gastrointestinal tract is more or less similar to the community that we'll have as adults. Um, and this changes as we age, but um, the point being that, you know, when we're young children, not only do we look very different developmentally, but our gut microbiome is also um, very different. And this is important when we're thinking of the context of diabetes, especially. There's been several different um, sequencing studies, you know, published in the last decade or so, um, illustrating that individuals who have type 1 diabetes are, um, they have a microbial community that's actually lower diversity or fewer different types of members of bacteria than individuals who are healthy. And so this um, graphic that I have popped up in the background here is uh, sort of a summary slide from some longitudinal sequencing that was done a while ago now sampling children who are uh, genetically at risk for, for T1D and finding that they could actually predict the onset of diabetes in certain children based on this um, diversity level of their, of their gut. And so this is very interesting that this is you know, coincident with um, microbial colonization and development, but it's also coincident with a lot of really important developmental processes of the host as well. And so our favorite process is this you know, a uh, period of postnatal beta cell expansion, where you're born with this differentiated number of beta cells, and they undergo this um, sort of one-time proliferative event uh, early on in life when you're about one or two years old. Uh, and then after that, they, they, you know, become more or less senescent. Beta cells are really long, long-lived cells, as we know in this group. Um, and the idea is that uh, your beta cells are expanding in order to establish this um, beta cell mass, which allows you to um, maintain your metabolic homeostasis through, throughout life. And so the obvious question that we had, you know, given um, the development of the microbiota at the onset of this uh, beta cell postnatal development event, we asked the question whether or not there could be um, particular organisms that were enriched early in life or, you know, particular bacteria that were actually required for beta cell development or beta cell proliferation postnatally. 
And uh, we turn to our notobiotic organisms that uh, Karen just described. And so looking initially in the larval zebrafish, believe it or not, zebrafish have a very conserved pancreas with humans. Um, they have a single islet with insulin producing beta cells. So when we looked into that islet, we found that germ-free larvae had many fewer um, insulin producing cells than their conventional counterparts that had a full and complete um, microbiome. And so we asked the question of whether or not, you know, this was an effect of specific members of the larval zebrafish gut. And so we did this screen using mono-associated animals um, where we added back these individual purified cultures of bacteria to germ-free fish and found that several of these bacterial species were sufficient to rescue beta cell development all on their own. Whereas there were many other members of the um, zebrafish gut microbiome that were insufficient for this process. So we were very curious what was special about these organisms, um, these three Aramona strains and this Shuanella strain. And so we um, kind of started to turn to our, our microbiology knowledge. And there is a vast number of things that bacteria are constantly secreting into their environment um, in the gut lumen. So you can imagine that slide that Karen showed initially with those bacteria swimming around in the gut. That's what we can see, but they're also you know, constantly interacting with their environment and secreting um, proteins and other, other small molecules through those activities. So we were curious if maybe there was a secreted product that was promoting this um, beta cell proliferative event. So we isolated cell-free supernatant from these um, microbes and found that it was indeed um, active on our germ-free fish. And we used um, a lot of biochemical approaches to narrow down um, the effector protein in this cell-free supernatant. And we found um, that at the time it was this putative protein and we gave it a name, um, BEF-A for beta cell expansion factor. So if we purified this protein, that we'd found in that cell-free supernatant, and then just added it back to our germ-free fish, we could um, robustly restore beta cell mass in germ-free larvae. And so these are otherwise completely um, germ-free animals, except for the addition of this purified protein that we called BEF-A. And so we were curious about um, you know, the phylogeny of BEF-A. And so when we looked for um, other bacteria that produced homologs of BEF-A, um, we found that, you know, it was kind of uh, sparsely distributed uh, or more randomly distributed across the bacterial phylogeny. Um, but excitingly, we did find that there were bacteria known to associate with humans, um, which are shown in blue on this phylogeny, that carried um, a homolog of BFA. And albeit these homologs were, um, you know, distantly related um, in their sequence composition, they actually still had activity on zebrafish. So we cloned a couple of these um, more distantly related homologs from Klebsiella and Enterobacter and found that they could also restore beta cell development. And so we were really motivated to understand how BEF-A works. Um, what is the mechanism that it's actually using on beta cells to promote proliferation? And remember, this was an unidentified putative protein, so we really know nothing about its function. So we turned to some very talented biochemists at the University of Oregon, Dr. Jim Remington and Emily Sweeney, who helped us to solve the atomic structure of BEF-A. And that's what is shown here. Um, you can see that it's made up of a series of alpha helices and this kind of partial beta barrel structure. It's a very nice little compact protein, but it still didn't really tell us too much about the function. It turned out that this structure was also novel. <laughs> Um, so it was hard to glean information about its structure. So what we did was we um, guessed what the structures of some of these um, functionally conserved homologs like Klebsiella might also look like. And so the Klebsiella modeled BEF-A structure is in black and we've overlaid it onto the green structure of BEF-A here. And what popped up was that the region that this structure overlays, so the Klebsiella structure is a lot smaller than, than BEF-A, but it perfectly overlays in this region where there's this predicted putative domain called an SYLF domain. 
And there's really not um, much known about this domain other than um, in, you know, it's produced in proteins uh, across um, the kingdom of life, um, both in humans as well as yeast and lots of other bacteria. And in those proteins where this domain exists, um, it tends to be important for um, lipid binding functions or organizing mechanisms at, at lipid membranes. But that's, that's all we really knew. So we wanted to know if this SYLF domain might actually contain the function um, of BFA. So we cloned a truncated version of BFA where we just have this SYLF domain and added it back to fish and found that it was sufficient to restore um, the function of promoting beta cell proliferation. So this SYLF domain became um, the region of interest for us. And like I just mentioned, um, the only real you know, leads in the literature for SYLF domains are its ability to interact with lipids. And so <clears throat> Dr. Emily Sweeney, our talented biochemist in Karen's lab, started to look at how BFA might actually interact with, with lipid membranes. And so using these fluorescently labeled synthetic vesicles, uh, she just started adding BFA to them and found this surprising phenotype where the vesicles started to kind of um, bleb or create these grape-like clustering phenotypes, um, suggesting that BFA might be manipulating or bending um, the lipid membranes. And so to illustrate that idea, um, we have this cartoon down here sort of showing that, you know, these nice synthetic vesicles, you know, blebbed over time until eventually they, they lysed or were completely gone. And so asking the question of whether or not they were lysing these vesicles, Emily did a um, fluorescent dye release assay, where now she has put a fluorescent dye inside of these vesicles, and then she can measure how much of it escapes the vesicle to see how much um, lysis is actually happening. And she found that compared to a water control, BFA was robustly able to um, elicit dye release from these vesicles. And we identified a few putative um, amino acids that might be involved in this lipid binding interaction. And when we um, mutated one of them at um, residue 195, we were actually able to reduce this um, vesiculation or um, you know, membrane uh, rupturing phenotype um, quite significantly. So um, this ability to uh, rupture or interact with um, lipid membranes is really reminiscent of antimicrobial peptides, um, which are you know, commonly produced by hosts at uh, mucosal surfaces in order to just control the um, microbial population and keep it from you know, overtaking the host. Um, so these are, you know, there's a variety of different antimicrobial peptides, but um, they really are important for lysing and interacting with bacteria. And bacteria also make um, a number of antimicrobial peptides to compete with each other um, over nutrients and, and niches. And so we asked the question of whether or not BFA was acting like an antimicrobial peptide. And we have this fluorescently labeled version of BFA where we attached an M cherry fluorophore to it and found that we could see it binding to the outside of um, bacteria, whereas you know, without the BFA version, we couldn't, couldn't see any of that binding. And this is work done by um, a former talented uh, trainee in Karen's lab, Elena Wall, who's currently working on her PhD um, at Anschutz. And she also, Elena, tested whether or not um, BFA could actively lyse bacteria, similarly to that synthetic vesicle assay that Emily had done. And so here um, in her assay, the loss of fluorescence is actually indicative of lysis. Um, and what she found was that BFA was actually able to lyse bacteria to a similar extent as a well-known antimicrobial peptide, which is host produced called Reg3, um, which forms pores in, in bacterial membranes and is quite well characterized. So really suggesting that this antimicrobial um, function of BFA, you know, through membrane permeabilization was something that, you know, why the bacteria might be making it. But we were, um, you know, very curious, you know, given this ability to directly interact with membranes and disrupt them, um, you know, could this be how uh, BFA was interacting with, with host beta cells? 
But in order to you know, directly interact with host beta cells, BFA has to be able to travel um, from its likely origin in the gut lumen to the pancreas itself. And so we just tested um, whether or not BFA could even reach the pancreas or whether the ability to get you know, into the pancreas was um, allowing our BFA's function. So this is work done by a talented former graduate student in Karen's lab, Michelle Masakoy. And she originally came at this question by trying to fluorescently, you know, trace um, a fluorescently tagged version of Befe through the zebrafish. And we found out that this was actually um, a lot more challenging than we thought. So she had to turn to some more clever uh, genetic techniques in the zebrafish. And so we started thinking about the actual anatomy of the gut and how it's, you know, intimately associated with the pancreas. And so that's what this um, cartoon image here is highlighting, that there's this direct connection between our duodenal lumen and the pancreas itself through this extrapancreatic duct. So Michelle asked the question of whether or not this extrapancreatic duct was required for Befe to exert its function on the pancreas. And she did that using these um, zebrafish, which have a mutated form of SOX9B. And these zebrafish mutants don't develop a patent extrapancreatic duct. So they're a great way to test this hypothesis. And so when she initially looked at SOX9B mutants that were just conventional animals, she found that they did have significantly reduced um, beta cell mass compared to their wild type counterparts. Um, but what was weird was when she added Befe to the water of these zebrafish, so Befe are these little green blobs, not to scale, <laughs> um, she found that Befe was still capable of rescuing beta cell development. So suggesting that when she added Befe to the water, um, it, you know, it, it could bypass this loss of the extra pancreatic duct. So she did um, you know, a really delicate experiment where she actually gavaged Befe into directly into the gastrointestinal tract of these larval zebrafish. And when she did that, she found that um, the loss of SOX9B resulted in the loss of the effect of Befe. So we started thinking you know, a little bit more about this um, thing where we could add Befe to the water Zebrafish um, are highly absorptive. Um, things that are in the water, you know, can immediately pass into the vasculature of zebrafish. And so we thought maybe it's um, that Befe is getting into the vasculature in this case where it can rescue when it's added to the water, despite the loss of this extra pancreatic duct. So we know that islets themselves are highly vascularized structures. And so she did this experiment where she just injected Befe into the bloodstream of these larval fish. So in wild type animals, um, this resulted in a rescue of this defect. And she did this same experiment using these SOX9B mutants, and again found that she could rescue, um, suggesting that as long as you have the ability to bypass this extra pancreatic duct loss, Befe can still actually disseminate or travel to the, to the pancreas and exert these phenotypes. So um, we moved on with this project by asking whether or not these phenotypes could be recapitulated in mammals, in mice. And so we looked into um, uh, neonatal mice, kind of trying to get ages that were similar in developmental stage to our larval zebrafish, and found that um, germ-free animals or animals that were treated with antibiotics also had significantly reduced beta cell mass. And excitingly, if we gava orally gavaged in Befe to these um, germ-free or antibiotic treated pups, we could robustly restore um, beta cell mass in these animals. So we also um, asked whether or not this ability to permeabilize membranes um, in mammalian beta cells might also promote their proliferation. And so we also isolated islets from neonatal mice, which are shown here. And we found that Befe was similarly to its ability to bind bacteria. It was actually also able to bind to, you know, the outer membranes of these beta cells and in some cases be absorbed inside of the cell. So it's also able to directly interact with um, mammalian islet beta cells. And so we isolated some islets from um, neonatal mice and looked at their ability to proliferate in vitro in response to adding Befe to these cultures. 
And we found that we could significantly increase rates of islet cell proliferation when we added BFA to these cultures. But remember that um, single nucleotide mutated version of BFA that I showed you a few slides ago, it had reduced capacity to actually elicit membrane permeabilization. And similarly, when we added it to this assay, we also found that it resulted in the loss of the ability of BFA to robustly induce beta cell proliferation. So really suggesting that it's this membrane permeabilizing capacity of BFA um, that beta cells are somehow sensing or tuning into um, to upregulate their proliferative um, cycles. And then um, sort of one last exciting bit of data is that we also tried administering BFA, you know, via um, a vascularized route um, to pups. Um, so we actually added BFA to germ-free animals with an IP injection and found that it was significantly able to um, rescue beta cell development. And this was accompanied by um, functional attributes of, of beta cells, you know, reduced blood glucose and increased um, serum insulin. So suggesting that Similarly to zebrafish um, and mice, BFA can also elicit um, beta cell levels and, and function. And so to just kind of conclude for how we're thinking about this in terms of, of you know, potential um, human disease, we've got this developing microbial community. Um, and one thing that I failed to mention is that um, those bacteria that carry homologs of BFA they tend to be enriched in um, microbes that are commonly also enriched in the infant or neonatal gut around the time that we see this nice um, increase in beta cell proliferation. And so it's possible that the presence of these, um, you know, specific bacteria at, you know, higher abundances at that time could be helping to drive this beta cell proliferative event. And so um, we're very curious about, you know, events early on in life that might disrupt that infant or neonatal community, resulting in the loss of some of these potentially really important members. Um, it, it's really common to go on antibiotics as a kid. Um, I know that I had multiple ear infections. I fear for my beta cell mass. <laughs> Um, but there are lots of ways to disrupt the infant micro microbiome. And so our hypothesis is that, you know, potentially in these individuals were reducing beta cell mass and possibly having a lasting impact, impact on um, glucose homeostasis capabilities. And so with that, I'm just going to turn it back over to Karen to um, highlight, you know, how all of this comes back together uh, for thinking about the evolution of these types of processes. Yeah, thanks so much, Jennifer. Yeah, and so just to to kind of come back to you know why why do bacteria make BFA? We don't think they're making it to prevent diabetes in humans, but we think that this is a kind of bacteria activity of bacteria living in multi species communities um, that would uh, be something that animals have evolved to use as useful information for developmental adaptations. And so um, we can think about, uh, you know, how animals may use bacteria to fine tune their developmental programs to meet their environments. And then the next slide, you know, one hypothesis would be that um, animals have learned to listen in to their gut microbes as a way to interpret what the environmental nutrient landscape looks like and how they should fine tune their beta cell mass to that landscape. So in an environment that's abundant in nutrients, you would expect to have a high diversity and high abundance microbial community in the gut that would be making a lot of befe like activities. And that might be an important cue um, that animals have evolved to listen into to upregulate production of their beta cells and to meet that nutritional need. In contrast, um, a situation of sparse nutrients uh, may be a situation where there's less BFA activity, uh, uh, less need for beta cells. And so unfortunately, maybe in our uh, very um, high hygiene environments, that children are developing now, they might be sort of mimicking this sparse nutrient environment and failing to induce a postnatal beta cell expansion 
that leaves them more vulnerable to uh, autoimmune attack later in life. So that's one way we're thinking about um, this relationship that's been revealed by the discovery of Beth A. So finally, we just want to um, acknowledge um, all of the work. I, I want to just really highlight this is Jennifer's uh, uh, works that she's driven in this remarkable journey from my lab as a PhD student, um, pursuing it in her postdoctoral training at University of Utah. And then she's also highlighted a number of people in my group and, and um, collaborators who've contributed to this story. And we'd be happy to take questions. Thank you both. This has been a really interesting and thought provoking discussion. Um, I'd like to go ahead and open the floor to questions now. If anyone has questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself or write your question in the chat box. Hello, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that great talk. I wanted to uh, clarify on the um, Beth A mutation. The uh, is it amino acid change and. Uh, was that in the SLF domain that that change happened? Like, how did, how was the mutation um, chosen? Yeah, great question. Um, it's a single amino acid change at, um, I think it's amino acid 195, which is within that SYLF domain. And we changed from an arginine to an alanine. So just trying to, um, what Emily did was to identify particular amino acids that were likely to interact with lipids based on their charges. Um, and so we had a variety of amino acids that were candidates for this. Um, and that was one of the ones that had the most robust impact on, on its function. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, it was a challenge because this is a novel protein. And so we we didn't really know, but we looked at um, what were residues that were on the surface that we, we speculated could be interacting um, with lipids. But it's still actually an area of active uh, research in my lab is to try to understand better how that the protein interacts with lipids. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for the very interesting presentation. I have a question regarding your last hypothesis that uh, I thought was very, very interesting. So um, the idea that the low bacterial diversity in children now may be related to um, maybe link with the, with the low uh, uh, beta cell uh, mass. So I was wondering whether you tested if there is a direct correlation between low diversity, bacterial diversity, and uh, uh, reduced uh, beta cell mass uh, in, uh, in children. Yeah, that's a fabulous question. So there are quite a few um, sequencing studies out there now, uh, one of the most well known being the Teddy study, where they are looking at this phenomenon of, um, you know, potential loss of diversity, and correlating that with the onset of disease. And it's actually quite a bit more complicated than, you know, we led on in that introductory slide. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from the ability to understand strain level variation from a lot of our sequencing studies. So we get um, a lot of information about taxonomic um, identity from these you know, sequencing studies from humans, but in microbiology, it's incredibly hard to kind of distinguish um, a lot of this strain level diversity, partially because of the note that Karen highlighted. We don't actually know what a lot of the genetic function of these microbes is. And there tends to be a lot of functional diversity that we can't actually resolve from some of these sequencing studies. So things like Beth A, um, they might be enriched at strain levels that we can't actually pick up from some of these sequencing um, things. So it, it becomes difficult to correlate specific loss of you know, diversity with, with um, uh, disease onset in a lot of these bigger sequencing studies uh, for, I think, reasons that are, you know, related to that strain level um, functional diversity, which also makes it, you know, so exciting to kind of dive into some of that for the first time. And I'll just point out that, so I think um, uh, Jennifer's approach going forward with her own lab is going to be exploring that in uh, experimental uh, animal models. I think it's a really fascinating question. Jennifer, nice talk. Um, I have a question uh, regarding um, like 
uh, beta cells also proliferate when they are stressed. Uh, is it possible that BAFA is causing kind of stress which is leading to beta cell proliferation or do you have any other pathway which you explore how actually BAFA is leading to proliferation of beta cells? Yeah, I'm going to send this one over to Karen because yeah. this is her lab. Yes, yeah. So yeah, I think that's a really insightful question. I would say um, that 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 that's definitely a, a line of thinking that we're pursuing, and um, you know it's interesting how you kind of def one defines stress, um, but uh, thinking more broadly on the impacts of uh, microbiomes on animal development, I often think that it the microbes cause a little bit of stress that can actually be beneficial to stimulate programs of cell proliferation, um, uh, regeneration and so forth. So another area of my lab also looks at proliferation of the intestinal epithelium in response to the microbiota. And there too, we find evidence that it's microbial activities that are a little bit immunostimulatory, a little bit stressful, but they are part of the normal program of that tissue growth. Uh, and so you can think of it as stress, but it's actually just, um, you know, uh, colonization is the normal state. The germ-free state is, um, is I think, hypo-stimulated. A great talk. Like the, it is so difficult to identify a better cell proliferating proliferation factor and you identified in, in my gut microbes that makes this story so fascinating. Congratulations. I have so many questions, but the, the I I the one is related to a did you test a gut microbe that has if A and all gavage this microbe and see if it has an effect on the beta cell proliferation. You use the purified protein injections and all gavage, but did you use a microbe? that has the protein? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we, we have a couple, and there's a couple answers to this. Um, we did engineer a protein that, um, an E. coli, uh, which is more of a commensal E. coli, to express Befe, and we added that to mice and saw that it could rescue beta cell development. But, um, we actually haven't gotten our hands on an actual isolate, say from humans or mammals that naturally produces Befe. And so it's something that we're actively seeking out and trying to identify. And so one of the interesting things about how Befe is expressed is that um, it's sort of randomly you know, produced across bacterial phylogenies. Um, we're not quite sure how it's inherited and this gets back to a little bit of that strain level variation. Um, we can't just identify a species and think that it will contain Befe. Um, and so it actually is probably a pretty rare product of the um, microbiome and the fact that maybe it might be more enriched by species you know, in the infant gut is probably helping to boost its, its abundance in that particular situation. Um, but we would love to have, you know, some isolates from humans or mammals that do produce their own forms of BFA and, and study them. Yeah. A related question is, have you ever tested BFA in type 1 or type 2 diabetes models, or this is what you will do in your lab, Jennifer? Yeah, this is something Karen is really interested in in doing. So we're we're definitely um, talking about collaborating on ways to to do that in mice in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, all great questions and good discussion there. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll wrap it up. Thank you again, both for the interesting presentation. We greatly appreciate it and look forward to hearing about your future research and related collaborations. Thanks Thank you so much. Thank you.